think uh, we're all set. Um, let me welcome you to this uh, lecture three, the last of the set of uh, overview lectures whose aim is to uh, bring you up to date to the point uh, where you can start thinking about your term paper. So what I'm going to do today is first of all, do a little bit of review um, of what we've done in the previous two lectures. We started out with the with two success stories of reinforcement learning. One is backgammon that dates to the mid 90s. And the other one is uh, Alpha Zero and Alpha Go, which uh, came up uh, about 20 years later, but they share a lot of uh, similarities in the structure. And both of them connect with uh, dynamic programming, approximate dynamic programming. Uh, the fundamental method of policy iteration, the idea of uh, limited look ahead and approximation in value space. And uh, you recall that um, we mentioned that there are really two algorithms in these, um, in these, uh, uh, in these players. One is the offline training algorithm, where we use a lot of uh, data self-generated data uh, to train uh, value and or policy networks. Uh, backgammon does not use a policy network, uh, chess does. And once this is done, it may take uh, days and months, okay? Uh, then in order for these players to play online with someone like you and me, they have to use a different algorithm, the online play, which involves multi-step look ahead, roll out, cost function approximations, and similar things. So that's the framework and the light that guides us. We aim to develop this methodology so that it applies far more generally, not only to games, but also to control systems design, to uh, operations research, resource allocation type of allocations, uh, combinatorial discrete optimization problems, and so on. So the vehicle for doing this is uh, dynamic programming, deterministic and stochastic. And I've shown here the stochastic problem for a finite horizon, whereby we start the some initial state and we go for n stages. And at the typical stage, we have a transition to a next state according to this system equation. Uh, the transition involves randomness embodied in this random parameter, which has given probability distribution. It can be cut diverse nature. Uh, together with the transition, there's a random cost that's incurred. And what we want is to minimize a cost function that involves the sum of the stage costs plus a terminal cost for the final state. And because it's a random variable due to the randomness of WK and the other stuff here, we take the expected value, the probabilistic expected value according to the distribution, probability distribution that's induced by the given distributions of WK. We are interested in policies consisting of component functions of the current state. Each of these mu K is a function of XK and it can be viewed as a lookup table. The lookup table for every XK gives us the control that we are going to apply at uh, that state. So for a given initial state, the cost of a policy starting from that state is a number after we take this expectation. And what we want to do is minimize this cost number uh, for every initial condition over the set of all policies. And an optimal policy is one that attains the minimum. So that's the formulation. And we consider also variance, infinite horizon variance, deterministic variance, and so on. So the dynamic programming algorithm produces the optimal costs to go. This J stars K of XK. This is the optimal cost of the tail subproblem that starts at XK and goes all the way to the end. 
and the algorithm generates these optimal cost functions starting from the end with a terminal, terminal cost function and then generating and then going backwards generating the uh, the cost functions of the earlier and earlier tail sub problems using this equation and the optimal cost is obtained at the very last step after we've gone n times through this algorithm here. Okay, so this algorithm gives you the J stars. And now to implement an optimal policy given the J stars, we can go forward. This is the offline training, so to speak. And this is the online play. Sequentially going forward, we observe XK and we apply a minimizing control in this expression. So we start with uh, X, U0 star, go to X1, then do it again, get U1 star and so on. After N steps, N minimizations, we uh, go through a run of the system. Now the difficult issues here is that, first of all, we need to know this J stars to do this minimization. That's the most difficult thing. And that's really why we have reinforcement learning. Uh, because we can't easily compute this J star, so we need to resort to approximations. But there are some other difficulties. Um, we need to compute this expected value, which could be costly. We need to compute this minimization, which also could be costly. And that's where uh, approximation in value space comes in to do this online play feasible, to make it feasible. We use J tilde, some approximate cost function in place of J star. We approximate perhaps this expected value in some way, and we approximate also perhaps this minimization, which I've called the three approximations. And this can be designed more or less independently of each other. And a lot of the course is going to deal with how you design these approximations. There are several different ways. So that's um, where we stopped the last uh, time. And now what we're going to do today, well, we've done the review and we're going to look at uh, problem formulations, examples. Um, of formulation and solution. Uh, we're going to look at problems that have a terminal state, a termination state, like the end of a game in chess or backgammon. We're going to look at various reformulations involving, uh, uh, involving um, simplifications, reformulations, and things like that. We're going to look at partial state information problems a big, big subject, which uh, for a reformulation to a perfect state information problem can be done. Multi-agent problems is going to be a significant subject in our course. And we're going to look into those and some of the ideas involved. And then we're going to look at adaptive control, a very important topic in control system design, which whereby we're faced with problem parameters that are either unknown or they change perhaps quite frequently over time and we have to adapt to these changes. So that's uh, what we're planning for today. And uh, let's start with problem formulations. Okay, now given a problem that looks like dynamic programming problem, how do you formulate it? Uh, it doesn't come neatly packaged uh, for you. You have to define controls stages, states, system equations, and so on. So each problem is different, but here is an informal recipe, my recipe, which I recommend to you. The first thing to define is the easiest one, which is the controls. Basically, you know the decision variables of the problem, more or less, and, uh, and so these are going to be the controls. Then, you have to break down the controls into stages. Okay, there's a little bit of uh, thought should be going into that, but that usually, uh, but that very often is quite, quite obvious. And it's defined by when information becomes available. In other words, if information comes in stages, these are usually the stages 
of your dynamic programming problem. And the last thing to define are the states. Now, how do you define states is a little bit of an art, but there's intuition that allows you to, to deal with that. And that intuition, I want you to remember. What do we want to define a state? Well, the state is what the controller knows when, when, when it chooses a control. So the state should be something that summarizes the past for the purposes of future optimization. It has to have all the information that's relevant for future optimization. So that as long as we know the state, all the past information, all other past information is irrelevant. So that should be the guiding intuition in selecting state. On the other hand, there may be several different ways for packaging uh, the information that's relevant. So you have to think a little bit about how you're going to do it. Okay, so this is the rationale. The state must subsume all information that's useful for decision control since the controller has action that depends on the state. Okay, um, as an example, remember the triangling salesman problem from the previous lectures where we have to design a tour that goes through a number of cities once and only once. And we took a state partial tours. In other words, the collections of the cities that we have visited in the past. So that's really the important information and other information such as how much cost uh, you incurred while visiting these past states doesn't need to be included. It can be reconstructed. Once you know the cities and you know the problem data, you can reconstruct this cost. Sure, you don't need to include this cost into the state because they don't add anything. Okay, now here's a more difficult case involving partial or imperfect information. There is here a quantity of interest that you would like to, 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 to have it as state. Uh, let's say in a, in a motion problem, uh, the position and velocity vector of a moving object is ideally the state that you'd like to have. On the other hand, you may not be able to know it. It may not be feasible to have exact values of position and velocity because, uh, okay, velocity may not be measurable, position may be measurable with radar, but the radar may not be perfect and the measurements of the radar may be noisy, okay? So you would like to have this, uh, this state, but you know it only imperfectly. So you cannot apply the dynamic programming algorithm as we know it. So what would you do here? Well, remember the idea, the state must subsume all the information that's useful for decision and control. Therefore, if IK is the collection of all the measurements that you have accumulated up to the current time, it is correct to use IK as a state. On the other hand, it may also be correct to use a summary of this information. This information may be too much, maybe a list of all the measurements you have, you have received uh, since time immemorial. Uh, it may be too much. So it, it is also correct to use a summary of this information that contain everything enough that's relevant. So we may also use alternative states and one such alternative state that's very important is the so-called belief state, which is the conditional probability distribution of the quantity of interest given the information. Now this belief state, it takes some thinking but it is also intuitively quite clear that it subsumes all the information that's useful for the purposes of control. It's like a probabilistic state. So in these problems, when we use belief states, basically we try to control the probabilistic state, not where we are, but where we think we are, so to speak. Okay we would leave this issue uh, 
for the moment, and we will come back to it later in this uh, lecture. I see something in the chat about extending the deadline for the first homework, which is due tomorrow. Um, I, if you cannot complete your homework, you can send me email. And uh, then on a case by case basis, I will give you an extension, okay? Otherwise the homework is still due by midnight tomorrow night. Are there any questions about that? Oh, I have a question about the first example. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, so I have a question about the first example. Can you hear me? It's a question. So, uh, so why is the cost need not be included? It seems the cost is important, right? The cost is what I'm, I, I don't understand. Repeat your question, please. Uh, it, it seems the cost are important. So why is the cost need not to be included in the state? Well, because the cost can be computed from the other information, which is the partial tour, the, vis the cities that you visited, and given that you have the data of the problem, you can recover this cost. Okay, okay. Also, okay. Uh, so it must subsume all the information that's useful for decision and control. It must subsume, not be all the information, okay? Uh, because okay. remember, uh, you're going to execute dynamic programming over the states, right? So yeah. there is an incentive for using as small state as possible. So any gratuitous additional information, you don't want to include it because that will complicate your life. It's going to make your dynamic programming algorithm more difficult to execute, okay? Okay, thank you. Uh, excuse me, I have a question regarding the first example. Uh, does this uh, definition of the state uh, can it be some kind of ambiguous? Like here, if we define the past cities visited as a state, uh, does it need to be defined as a sequence of the cities or it can be just a set of the cities without the order of visit? Um, okay. Uh, the sequence should be included, although it probably doesn't make dif a difference in this problem. What is important really is the identity of the cities that you have visited so that you know them and you cannot visit them in the future, right? Because that's prohibited. Okay, okay, I see. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, can I have one more question regarding yes, the first one? So, um, for the state, um, uh, all the state must be like independent with each other, or there should be some dependency among the states. Among I, I don't, I'm not sure what you mean independent. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. the states I mean, are ordinarily dependent, right? Yeah, since they we related. want to include subsume all the information that are useful for the decision into the state. So that kind of information, are they are this kind of information must be independent with each other or they have some dependency. For example, in the uh, example in the first question, so for the cost, because cost can be computed by using other information. So we don't include it that into the state. So how about the other kind of information? I just uh, curious yeah, about it. Yeah, you're right. It's important to have the sequence here. Otherwise you would not be able to compute the, although still that's not relevant, What's relevant in this particular example, okay? 
It's okay. Because all that's relevant is to know what where you've been before. Okay, the order by which you've been is not so important. On the other hand, you're right that the the states are correlated, right? Because uh, okay, successive states in the traveling salesman problem differ by only one city. So there's a lot of overlap between them and correlation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, first the controls, then the stages, and then the states. Um, how about the horizon now? Do you choose finite or infinite horizon? Usually that's fairly clear too, except uh, in the case where you have a termination state, a terminal state, which is cost-free and absorbing in the sense that once you visit it, you stay there and at no cost. Like for example, in games like chess and backgammon, the end of the game is a terminal state, okay? So essentially the control ends when you reach this terminal state, but we don't know when this termination is gonna happen. It may happen in a few steps or many steps, or it may happen in an unbounded number of steps. However, suppose that you know a bound on the optimal number of stages. In other words, the number of stages that corresponds to an optimal policy. There's some bound. Then you can introduce this bound as a horizon. And just to make sure that you're not making optimal, some states, uh, some, some, some control sequences that uh, call control policies that, uh, that are not optimal, you add an incentive for terminating by including a big penalty for not terminating before the end of the horizon, okay? So if you reach the end of the horizon and you have not terminated, then you're going to pay a big penalty and that makes termination desirable, provides an incentive. So that's one technique to deal with this. Of course, if you don't have such a bound, then you have to resort to an infinite horizon type of problem involving a termination state, what we've called the shortest path or stochastic shortest path problem. So here's an example, uh, multi-vehicle routing. Here you have two vehicles and they're going to go onto a road network to perform some tasks. And the tasks are at nodes seven and at node nine. And uh, uh, what you'd like to do is perform all the tasks uh, in a minimal number of steps, minimize the number of vehicle moves to perform all tasks. Now the vehicles move one step at a time, one, one, one node at a time. So I'm showing here the optimal sequence. Uh, vehicle one should go to this one, vehicle two should go to this one, and the total is uh, five moves, okay? Now, what would you take as state here? How would you formulate this problem as a dynamic programming problem? It certainly is a deterministic problem. What would you be the state and what would be the horizon? Well, we go back to the recipe. Include as state all the information that's relevant for the purposes of future optimization. So the location of the tasks that remain is certainly relevant. The location of the vehicles is certainly relevant. Is there anything, given those, is there anything else that we should add to the state? Well, what could that be? Information of how we got there, whether we have revisited node two or one, that's not relevant. There's a clean separation between these positions and these positions here uh, between past and future. So I claim that a proper an appropriate state is the position of the vehicles, this pair, one, two, and also the location of the tasks. Um, I have a question. Wouldn't you also need the time as a variable in the state? 
because how else would you add the penalty for not terminating before the end of the horizon? Ah, uh, okay, that's a good question. Uh, okay, if we wanted to formulate this as a finite horizon problem, we should eyeball the problem and figure out some bound for the optimal number of moves. Well, if you design any path to go to the tasks and add the corresponding times, then that would be an upper bound, right? The number of moves, uh, that would be an upper bound for the horizon, okay? So let's, we're, we are doing that, we're going to be doing that, uh, but we're not gonna pay too much attention for it, uh, to it for the moment. Cool. Okay, now notice that the number of states is astronomical even for a modest number of tasks and vehicles, okay? It's exponential in everything. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, this type of multi-vehicle routing problems are some of the most difficult combinatorial problems that uh, you'll find. So we have to use some kind of approximation technique, a reinforcement learning technique. And in particular, this problem is well suited for rollout. So for rollout, we need a base heuristic, which is relatively easy to implement. So here's a suitable base heuristic. Move the vehicles one at a time, one step along the path to the nearest task, okay? So the base heuristic at this state here that I'm showing in the figure starts with vehicle one, goes to three, okay? One step to the nearest task. I'm sorry, I messed up. Starts from vehicle one and goes towards the nearest task, which is this one. It's two steps rather than three. So from one, it goes to four. Then vehicle two also goes to the nearest task, goes to four. Then vehicle one goes to seven. Now vehicle two is at four, however, the that this task has been performed already. So it has to go here in search of a task. Now vehicle one is going to go to here. Vehicle two, which is now here, is gonna go here and so on. So the base heuristic seems reasonable, but does unreasonable things. He takes vehicle, vehicle one to this task, and takes vehicle two all the way to this task, okay? And it takes uh, takes nine moves, two moves to get here, one, two, three, four, five, but uh, the other, I think it's a total of nine moves, okay? What is the optimal is uh, five moves. Okay. So now we are going to use the base heuristic for rollout. And we hope that rollout is going to do better. We expect it to do better because we know that, that rollout improves on the heuristic. So let's see how this is gonna happen. So to apply rollout at the current state, we should consider all possible joint vehicle moves, all pairs of moves, of the two vehicles. And from each one of these pairs, run the base heuristic to termination. Then use the joint move that results in minimum cost. Then we repeat at the next state and so on. So we start at uh, the state one, two, and we consider the possible joint moves. The move three, five. Vehicle one goes to three, vehicle two goes to five. There are four possible pairs here, three, five, three, four, four, five, and four, four. So from each one of those moves, we apply the base heuristic and we choose the best possible move. So let's examine three, five. At position three, five, three, five, Vehicle one starts going to the closest, uh, the closest uh, uh, task. 
So it moves from three to six, okay? Vehicle two is over here. Uh, it moves to the nearest task, so it goes back to two, okay? Vehicle one goes from six to nine and performs the task at nine. Vehicle two now is at two and goes to four. Then vehicle one from nine goes to 12, aiming towards this task here. Vehicle two is at four, it goes to seven and perform the task and we're done. So we took one, two, three, four, five, six moves in addition to the two initial ones. So we are done with this joint move and we have computed essentially the Q factor corresponding to this state and this move. So now we are going to go to our next move and compute the corresponding Q factor in the associated cost. So we look at three and four. From three, we go to six. From four, we go to seven and we perform this task. And then from six, we go to nine and we're finished. So this one took three moves plus the two is five. So we're done with the second Q factor. Then we look at the next Q factor, which corresponds to four, five, four, four, five. And then the Q factor four, four. And after we evaluate all of them, the winner is this one, three, four. Now, this gives you the first step of rollout. We have gone from one, two, to three, and four. We repeat starting from that and we keep going. And after you do the calculation, it's pretty easy to see that the rollout algorithm performs optimal. It matches the optimal solution. While the base heuristic needs nine moves, the rollout needs only five moves. Okay. So this is the kind of calculations that are involved for rollout in discrete combinatorial type of problems. And we will come back to calculations like that in the future. Are there any questions here? Um, yes, I have a question, just want to clarify. So um, the number that marked in the red is a, the reward for that kind of um, move or the action? The numbers you read are the ID numbers of the vehicles. This is vehicle one, vehicle two, vehicle one, vehicle two. Oh, okay, that's a reward. And the black, reward. Uh, okay, I get it. Yeah, these are the moves and these are the vehicles that are making the moves. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. And this is the, the, the joint move pair that we are evaluating, okay? So three, five, then our heuristic moves first vehicle one towards the nearest task goes to six, from three goes to six and so on. So, okay, sorry, I should have mentioned here that uh, the color coding of, uh, of the solution. Any other questions? Okay, so let's look at other reformulations. Uh, suppose that we have a system equation where the next state depends not only on the current state and the current control, but also on the preceding state and the preceding control. So now we don't have a problem the way we want it, right? To apply dynamic programming. What do we do? Well, we follow the recipe use as state all the information that's relevant for the purpose of future optimization. Clearly at time K, when we apply UK, it is important to know the previous state because it affects the next state. Similarly, the next control. So we should include these previous states and controls as additional state variables. That's the trick. This is called state augmentation. 
and which deals with this delay type of problem and other related problems by adding more state variables. Okay, so now we have an expanded state which includes this Y's and this S's. And here's the vector of augmented states, the augmented state at time k plus one. And it depends on the augmented state at time k, xk, yk, sk, the current control, and the disturbance. So we have a new system equation, this f tilde k. f tilde is this entire vector uh, of new states. And the new state is x tilde, which includes the delayed state and control. So everything is fine, except that with a bigger state, our dynamic programming algorithm has become more difficult, more time consuming. The state space has increased. And here's a dynamic programming algorithm. It starts at the terminal state. This is the initial condition. And at the typical state, it involves minimization, not only for every current state, but also for every current augmented state, which includes the previous state and the previous control and the optimal control that you will apply at this state depends on xk minus one and uk minus one, as you would expect. However, the calculations become more difficult. Obviously also, if you have delays in this equation that extend back several more steps, then the dynamic programming algorithm becomes accordingly more difficult. Notice also that we could have, could have included delays in the cost function. Uh, and uh, then the algorithm would be essentially the same. That would work. I should say also that state augmentation applies in a number of different contexts. For example, if this WK has probability distribution that depends not only on XK and UK, but also depends on previous Ws. Then knowledge of previous Ws tells you something about WK and should be included in the state. So there are many different ways that you can, you may need state augmentation, and, uh, but it's a powerful tool. Uh, and just about with state augmentation and reformulation, just about any problem that you can think of will fit our framework. It's just a matter of the dynamic programming algorithm and the solution becoming more difficult when you introduce complications uh, like the delays and things like that. Okay, here's another reformulation, rather simplification. I'm sure all of you know the name game of Tetris, right? Uh, it involves a wall of bricks. With uh, shapes falling down, which you can translate and rotate. And then they fit into the slots within this wall. And every time you complete a full row, then you score one point and that row disappears from the wall. So the wall goes up and down as you're more successful or less, less successful in removing uh, rows. And uh, it's a game that terminates when the top of the wall reaches the top of the frame. And you want to maximize the number of uh, your score, the number of rows that you uh, that you that you that you end up with. So what is the state here? Okay. Well, the board position, the wall, the current wall is certainly part of the state, right? Knowing the shape of the falling block is also useful, right? I mean, you need to know that in order to make translations and rotations. And whatever happened in the past 
how you got into this kind of uh, shape of world doesn't really matter. You have to look into the future and that's the state uh, that you need. So that's the state and the control is the translation and rotation on Y. How about horizon? Well, it's not easy to place a bound on the number of steps that you're going to, that, that, that uh, it's going to, are going to be needed before you terminate. So this problem ordinarily would be formulated as an infinite horizon problem with termination state reaching the top of the frame. Okay, so now let's look at a simplification. Uh, when you're trying to find the, the cost function of uh, this state, you need to solve Bellman's equation. Bellman's equation is a functional equation that involves a cost function as a function of X and Y. On the other hand, if you look at Bellman's equation, uh, Y cannot be affected by the control. In other words, the controller comes over here and looks at this position and can evaluate the score of the position without looking at the at the shape that's falling down because it cannot really control that, that shape. So if you take Bellman's equation involving both components of the state X and Y and average this equation over the shapes, P sub Y is the probability that a shape is Y. So take the expected value of both sides of Bellman equation, then you can average out the shape and the cost function becomes a function of just the board position. And that's quite a bit of simplification, right? Still, the problem is extremely difficult because the number of configurations of the world is astronomical, but this is a modified Bellman equation that is simpler than what you would have otherwise. The idea is to average over uncontrollable components of the state in the Bellman equation. Incidentally, this uncontrollable component provides also the uncertainty. It's really, um, it's really the W of this problem. G here is the number of points scored when you are at um, X, Y and you apply control U and F is the next board position. So that's the way ordinarily you would apply infinite horizon dynamic programming to the Tetris problem. And we will come to this problem later when we deal with approximations, because this algorithm, as I said, is not executable. It's just impossible to implement in view of the astronomical number of the states. Okay. Here's another example involving also uncontrollable state components and the terminal state. This is a kind of acute problem that miraculously admits an analytical solution. I'm saying miraculously because there are very few problems that admit an analytical solution. Here we have a driver that wants to drive to his destination and wants to park on a parking lot. The parking lot involves uh, N parking spaces and a garage at the end. Parking at a particular parking space has a different cost from the point of view of the driver, okay? The driver wants to perhaps park close to his destination and some spaces may be preferable than others. Here we assume that if he parks at location K, the cost is C of K. However, he goes in one direction only, and if he gets to the garage without parking, then he has to park at the garage, and that cost is high, okay? He prefers to park in one of those spaces which uh, have less cost, but also he wants to get close to his destination. 
So the driver starts at spot zero, spot zero, and either, and having reached spot K, either parks at this cost, if the space is free, or continues towards the garage. And uh, you can imagine that the optimal policy would be something like, we don't want to park in the early spaces, we want to wait, but then we don't want to wait for too long because we run the risk of having to park in the garage. And incidentally, the status of a spot is observed only upon reaching it. In other words, the driver does not have telescopic view. When he is at spot one, he can only see the status of this spot. He cannot look forward into two and other spots to see if they are free or they are taken. So how do we formulate this problem as a dynamic programming problem? Well, there's a termination state, there's a clear horizon, okay? And the stages are very clear. The controls are very clear. Uh, park if the spot is free or not park, okay? Uh, so, it's fairly clear that the stage should be the current spot that we are at is free or the current spot that we are at is taken. However, there's a third state here, the state where we have already parked, okay? The terminal state. So there are three states for every stage. However, uh, from the point of view of dynamic programming, uh, the whether a spot is free or taken is an uncontrollable state, cannot be influenced by decision of the driver. So we may consider the average cost, the expected cost upon arrival at position K, but before seeing whether that position is free or is taken. And this algorithm does not involve two numbers, but involves only one number, okay? Uh, it is averaged over whether the spot K is, uh, is, uh, is free or whether the spot K is taken, in which case we can only continue and go to the next state. And uh, uh, this algorithm is very simple to implement, okay? You start, uh, it's a very, very simple calculation. You start uh, with n minus one, and it's a simple calculation. And after n of those calculations, you're done. And the optimal policy is also easy to obtain. It's kind of cute. It's what you would expect. You park at the first free spot within some distance from the garage. And that distance depends on the problem data and is determined by this algorithm. Actually, I should say that this is the form of the optimal solution, assuming, uh, assuming that this parking spots are proportional to the number of steps away from the garage. Okay. So it's sort of a cute solution, but this problem is very simple. And the point I want to make is that if you make even slight changes to this problem, it can become very, very difficult. So here are some complications that we can throw at this problem. Again, we have the same parking lot, the same driver starting from here. We have the garage, we have this parking course. However, we allow the driver to return. He can either go forward or he can go backwards, presumably to go to a spot that he has seen that's free, okay? So we can go back to parking spots that we have visited at a certain cost, okay? So that complicates the problem. For example, the horizon, the length of the horizon becomes an issue because here you can consider a driver 
that's so stupid that goes back and forth between k and k plus one and takes an infinite number of steps without parking. Okay. So, okay. I guess uh, we can deal with that because uh, we can pretty much put a bound on the optimal number of moves to take uh, to make uh, uh, given that we start at zero. Here's another complication. Instead of having a linear parking lot, we can have a network of uh, parking positions. Okay. Then defining the states, defining Okay, the horizon becomes more difficult. Uh, um, the states uh, become uh, more complicated because uh, uh, we have to remember uh, the three positions that we have seen and they may lie on the network and so on. Here's a further complication, multi-agent versions. Suppose that instead of one driver, we have multiple drivers who are competing for parking spots. Uh, the drivers or autonomous vehicles without a driver, okay? An automated parking lot, so to speak. Uh, then we will have multiple decision centers. Each driver becomes a decision maker. Moreover, you may have drivers that want to park and you may have a sophisticated parking lot that has searchers that go around and look for free spaces to communicate to the drivers. Now here's another major uh, issue. There's a relatively easy version of this problem where the status of spots that we have already seen stays unchanged. In other words, in this easy case, a free spot remains free. No driver can come in and take that spot. We're talking again about cases of uh, where there are some other drivers. So once we go forward and we have seen a free space, we can always go back to that space and be sure that it's going to be free. The more complex case is when the status of already seen spot changes probabilistically. In other words, a free spot may become taken with a certain probability, or a taken spot may become free with a certain probability. Then we don't know the status of the parking lot. We have a belief state, perhaps, a probability distribution or probabilities that a particular, uh, a particular spot is going to be free. And we may consider an algorithm that uh, is based on, um, that involves this belief state. That takes us to imperfect state information problems, which is our next subject. Okay, are there any questions uh, here about this parking problem? Okay, so we're going back to this bi-directional parking, we can go in both directions. And uh, we consider the more complex case where the free or taking parking spots that we have seen may get taken or free up at the next time step with some probability. So the status of the parking lot evolves like a Markov chain where the, the free taking status of all the positions is the state of the Markov chain. However, we don't even observe the exact state of that Markov chain. All we have is a belief state, probability distribution of the state. So the free taking state of the spots is estimated in a probabilistic sense based on the observations. The free take, the observations here are the inspections that we make of the spots when we visit it. Each time we visit, remember we see whether it's taken or it's free. So this is, these are our observations and they are imperfect state observations. So now what should the state be? Remember our recipe, 
it should summarize all the information that's needed for the purpose of future optimization. So as first candidate for the state is the set of all observations so far. The free or taking status of the spots that we have visited, when we have visited. So it's a big list of observations, and uh, but it's a legitimate state. It summarizes all the information we need to know for the purposes of future optimization. But there's another candidate, which is the belief state, which are the conditional probabilities of the free taking status of all the spots. So there's a probability that spot zero is free, spot one is free, and so on. And these are conditional probabilities, conditioned on all the information that we have accumulated so far. All these observations that we have made induce a conditional probability of uh, the status of every spot and altogether these probabilities form the belief state. And dynamic programming should be carried out over the set of all belief states, which is continuous and very, very difficult to deal with because the number of states may be may also be very large to begin with. And the probability distribution over those is also accordingly large. Uh, N here could be very large, okay? Or think of a network, uh, then the state becomes more complicated and so on. And probability distributions over that, over those states is a very, very difficult object to deal with. So this type of problems, which are known in the literature as POM DP, partially observed Markov decision problems. These are among, perhaps they are the most difficult problems in dynamic programming and also in reinforcement learning. Uh, solving them exactly is possible in principle by dynamic programming with the state being the belief state, the probability distribution of the set of observations given the set of observations up to time k. However, the exact solution is impossible, except for toy problems, real toy problems involving two or three or four states, okay? Once you go to any kind of realistic problem, the exact solution is completely out of the question and you have to resort to approximations like the kind of things that we're going to consider in this course approximation value space, policy iteration, rollout, and so on. Okay, so now here is a more formal view of partial state observation problems and the reformulation via belief state. The main uh, fact is that the belief state can be viewed as a state of another problem which the controller observes and applies control. For each belief state, for each probabilistic state, we apply a control. That's a policy now for this new problem. And there's a new system. The new system got, uh, uh, the new system gives the evolution of this belief state, and it is something like this. The new belief state at time k plus one is obtained as a function of the belief state at time k, the control that you apply, and also zk plus one, which is the observation that you get, the new observation that you get at this time. Given the probability distribution of uh, the new observation, the probabilistic data about ZK plus one. And given the current belief state, it is possible to construct an estimator that estimates the next belief. And there are ways of doing that. And I'm not going to go into the details because I just want to give you the general idea. There are so-called particle filters, Kalman filters, uh, a lot of uh, methodology that uh, people in control have been using for decades uh, may come into play 
for, uh, for uh, constructing these belief estimators. There's also an average cost at each stage, which is the expected cost of the stage given the current belief state and given the current control. So it, will, it involves a condition expectation of cost based on the belief state where you are. So now this is a, another, a different stochastic dynamic programming problem of perfect state observation to which our dynamic programming algorithm applies. The optimal cost to go at time k in a belief state uk is the minimum of the sums of the one stage cost plus the expected cost to go. And the expectation is taken over the new disturbance, which is the observation zk plus one. Now, this is an algorithm that you can write, but it involves a very, very complicated uh, state space. So you can only solve this problem. Uh, you can only apply this algorithm with approximations. Okay, UK is the control constraint. I explain what G hat K is, expected cost of stage K uh, with a distribution of uh, X and W determined by the belief state and the distribution of WK. All of this to flesh out rigorously takes a couple of pages, okay? I'm just giving you the summary and we will return to this formulation in the future. The, and again, the belief estimator, we're going to see examples of belief estimators in the future. Um, and uh, we are going to, uh, we're going to leave this subject at this point. Are there any questions of what we've done so far? I have a question, Professor. Um, I know you are going to come back to uh, this partially observable uh, state problems, but it, it seems to me that the state space or the, the number of belief states would in general be infinite because you would have a, like a, set of fi a finite set of states, but then to get the belief states, you would have to cross that with the interval zero to one because every state would have some real probability associated with it. Uh, am I mistaken? No, you're absolutely right. That's part of the difficulty here. Even if the original states were finite in number, like the spaces in the parking lot, uh, it's a finite number of them. Yeah. Uh, the belief uh, state is a probability distribution over those. So if yeah. there are three, three states, let's say, then the belief state lives in a triangle, right? A mm. continuous triangle. If there are n states, then the belief state is a probability lives in a simplex, an n-dimensional simplex. So it, the belief state is always continuous, mm. and and that means that uh, you have serious problems with dynamic programming. You have to discretize that space, or you have to do something else. Okay, I see. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so we'll take a break now, 15 minute break. And then we, when we come back, we're going to talk about multi-agent problems. And then after that, adaptive control. I have a question. Before we get into multi-agent problems, there is this, uh, there's a question in the chat by Nicholas Dodd. Are Bayesian methods generally applicable for PomDP problems? Okay. Bayesian methods is a whole methodology called Bayesian optimization. I presume that you're talking about that. Is that correct? Nicholas, are you there? Yeah, that's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm not sure about PomDP, but uh, they are relevant to our subject. And uh, it's... Uh, it's likely that we will spend a lecture or thereabouts on Bayesian optimization and how you use a, a rollout in 
in conjunction with this. If you have a special interest on this subject, you can write to me and I can give you some references. But for the moment, I can't go any further. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. So, multi, multi agent problems. Okay. It's an old subject, it dates to the 60s. And uh, it was not called multi agent then, it was called team theory or decentralized control. Um, I actually worked on this subject when I was a PhD student uh, for a while and then convinced myself that it was, that was too difficult and I would not be successful. And I switched to something else. Um, but uh, the subject is going on strong now and with the computational methodology and the know-how we have today, we can solve problems that are multi-agent in an active uh, area of research. What does it refer to? It refers to several decision-making centers, which we call agents. And each one of them has a control variable associated with, uh, with it. So agent one has controls U1, agent two controls U2 and so on. So the overall control has M components. That's the characteristic, the most, the most salient feature of this multi-agent problems is that you have a breakup of the control component into control vector or control into components. Now, these agents collect information and they share information, perhaps selectively, and uh, they select information with some kind of, em of em with the environment, and uh, uh, and and uh, agent I applies decision U I sequentially in discrete time based on the information that's received. So at time zero, these agents have some information. They apply a decision. Then they get more information at time one and they apply the new, a new decision and they exchange information as necessary, collect information. And this keeps going on until the end of the horizon. Okay. Now, there are many, many different structures of this type and we're going to see some of them. Think of, for example, of the, of multiple vehicles going around on a road network to execute tasks or think about parker uh, drivers that want to park in a parking lot and so on. However, there is from a mathematical point of view, there's one major distinction. Uh, and this is whether the problem has the classical information pattern whereby the agents are fully cooperative. They have a common objective and more importantly, they fully share information and they never forget information. So at all times they have common information. So because of this commonality of information, you can treat this control, even though it has multiple components, you have treated as, as having just a single component by dynamic programming. Now that's important because uh, Dynamic programming is a very strong and well-developed methodology, and uh, it provides you with uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, approaches to deal with to deal with your problem, both in exact and approximate form. Now, this problem is uh, relatively easy. It's not really easy; it can be very, very difficult. But it's relatively easy when compared to this problem here which involves the so-called non-classical information pattern, where the agents may have some private information which they don't share, or they may be antagonistic. And this problem is hard, very hard, because you cannot apply dynamic programming to it. You can apply other methods, perhaps, but the fact that you can't, don't have dynamic programming work, working for you is a real impediment in the solution process. 
Now, these problems, as I said, were popular in the, the 60s, and then they kept on going strong up until through the 70s and into the 80s. But that, then the field uh, sort of lost steam. Uh, people could not make much progress so with uh, the theory that could be possible at that time and with the computers that were available at that time. On the other hand, about 15 years ago or so, reinforcement learning came along and uh, new methods, approximation methods were introduced. Uh, more powerful computers were available and, uh, and people have started having some success with these problems. And the field is very, very hot these days within reinforcement learning. <clears throat> now, we are going to, to deal primarily with a classical information pattern. Later, we're going to talk about uh, some non-classical information pattern ideas. But for the moment, we're going to focus on the classical information pattern. And um, conceptually, uh, it's as if there's some cloud that acts like a clearing warehouse of information, collects all the information from everywhere, and then passes on state information to the agents, which apply control as a function of the state information received. So this is a conceptual model, and, the, and it admits a discrete time stochastic system formulation with some state X and control U. However, the control U has M components corresponding to the M agents. Um, and I should point out here that agents is just a metaphor. The important structure is M components. And this may be M robots going around uh, in, within some space executing tasks in a co cooperative way, or they may all, all the agents may reside on the same robot. Maybe M different arms that the robot has that have to co coordinate in order to execute a particular task. So don't think of multiple entities. You can think of, think of this as a mathematical object involving a component structure and the difficulty with this structure, one major difficulty is that the search space is very large. Even if this, if each one of these components takes a binary value, zero or one, the search space, the space of all U is two to the M, grows exponentially with the number of agents. And immediately you're faced with difficulties that have to do with taking the minimum in the dynamic programming algorithm, uh, doing a rollout or optimization, uh, approximation value space and so on. So even though we have a theoretical framework that is solid based on dynamic programming, we will reformulate that for faster computation. And in particular, we're going to deal with the exponential size of the control space. As I mentioned here, it grows exponentially with the number of agents. Moreover, because we have these multiple components, it may be possible in, uh, in a favorable case to compute the agent controls in parallel. And, uh, and uh, we're going to consider that also it's going to speed up the computation, but it will also provide the gateway for dealing in part with the non-classical information pattern issues. So all of this is for the future, but for the moment, I want to illustrate how we deal with the exponential size of the control space by reformulation. Okay, so here's an example involving spiders and flies. There are 15 spiders. Each one moves in uh, the four directions of, uh, of a grid, one step at a time, right? And uh, or it can stay where it is. Uh, and there are flies here, three flies that do not do anything purposely. They just uh, move at random. 
and the spiders want to move in and catch the flies in minimum time. So that's the problem. And I'm framing in terms of spiders and flies just uh, to make it uh, sort of more interesting. It's representative of many multi agent type problems. The spiders here are viewed as the agents. For example, multi vehicle routing. We had an example of that earlier. Multi robot maintenance. They go around the pipeline and they repair various uh, damages. Search and rescue, where there are rescuers trying to find the people that need to be rescued, they which move at random. Um, firefighting. The flies are the fires, the firefighters are the spiders. Okay. So now notice that the control space has 15 components. It's huge. Each one of the spiders have five degrees of freedom, five possible choices, right? So it's about five to the 15 joint move choices. It's an extraordinary number. It's impossible to do anything with this number. Now, by reformulation, we're going to reduce this to five times 15 choices, five choices for each spider. And there are 15 spiders each. And the total is going to be 75, while at the same time maintaining good properties in a solid dynamic programming framework. And uh, the idea is to break down the control into a sequence of one spider at a time moves. So the way we're going to reformulate it, spider one is going to choose first a move. It's going to communicate this move to spider two, who is going to choose a move, then to spider three, spider four, and so on. So one spider chooses at a time with at most five moves. So the total number of uh, moves to consider are going to be five times 15. Okay, so I'm going to illustrate that, but I want to alert you that there is a, there's a video that involves, uh, there's some videos for these problems and illustrate the methods that we're going to be using. And this is, uh, this is from a talk that I gave some time ago. Um, uh, and uh, part of the videos involve spiders and flies and some other videos that involve uh, multi-robot maintenance, which was done as, a, as part of a, a joint paper with uh, uh, four uh, co-authors, including Sahil Baidial, by the way, who is uh, our grader for this course. Um, and uh, and I think the videos and the talk can explain you a lot more than I can in this uh, in this lecture. So back to the question of breaking down the control into a sequence of moves. This is the reformulation idea. We will trade off control space complexity with state space complexity. This is an old idea that goes back to my neurodynamic programming book from 25 years ago. Here, we take a stage which involves transition from state X to state X bar. And instead of having a one shot transition according to this equation, we break down the transitions into M pieces. So we unfold the control action. So at this state, we apply control U1 and then move to a new state, which includes X and U1. Then we apply U2 with knowledge of X and U1, then U3, one at a time. And then at the last step, we apply the last component UM and we have the entire vector u and we move to this to this new state. And at that time, we also incur a cost. There is no cost for these transitions, just a cost at the end. 
Now, the control space, if you view this as stages, the control space has been simplified a great deal. However, there's a price to be paid for this. Namely, we have additional transitions involving larger state spaces and corresponding cost functions. Yes, this problem can be solved by dynamic programming because uh, it, is, uh, it is equivalent to the original and it's amenable to dynamic programming. However, the dynamic programming algorithm has to be executed over a space of X, a space of X U1 and so on. And there are additional cost functions that involve these control components. So if we are contemplating an exact solution, then this is, does not help us very much. But we are not going to contemplate exact solution. Instead, we're going to look for approximate solutions, in particular rollout. This formulation applies a far more efficient rollout, which is one agent at a time. The first agent chooses a control. Then the next agent chooses a control using the base policy to evaluate the future and using also the control that was chosen by the previous, uh, at the previous step. So we will apply standard rollout for this reformulated problem. It's a lot easier. The computations are much easier. And uh, the increase in size of the state space does not adversely affect rollout because only one state per stage is looked at during online play. So we don't care how big this state space is. We're going to look at only one state of this state space. And we're going to do only one type of computation with the controls of that stage. And there's a significant complexity reduction because the one step look ahead branching factor of this problem is reduced from n to the m to n, the number of possible choices for each component but m times. So the number of choices, the number of q factors that we have to look at is m times m as opposed to n to the m. At the same time, we get the benefit of rollout, which is performance improvement, okay? Cost improvement over the base heuristic that you have. So this is a very, very convenient way to apply rollout. And uh, let me just go back to this spiders and flies example. We're going to be doing a rollout for these spiders, but one at a time. And we're going to be evaluating for each one up to five different choices with the previous choices in the state made by the previous spiders in the order and the future choices are going to be made with a uh, with a, a base heuristic, which uh, is, it can be a shortest path type of heuristic for this grid. And incidentally, this is going to be your next homework problem, so uh, you're going to get a chance to practice with it in uh, in the next week. <clears throat> Uh, Professor, I have a question on the next slide. Yeah. Why is the W component not a part of the substages like X U1 comma W1? Is that is there a reason for that or? Uh, right. This transition is trivial. From X, I apply U1 and I get the pair X U1. Right. But there's no, that, these are deterministic transitions. Oh, okay. At zero cost. Okay. Oh, it's only the last one that's random and involves a cost. But would the noise, because each agent would have an action which could fail, I'm thinking of something like picking a block or picking a ball using a gripper, and each of the agents could have something collectively that fails. Does the single W capture that? Yeah, I'm not quite sure what your concern is, but uh, but. Oh no, I, I can email you that. I think so. It's a. Pretty, yeah. yeah. Um, this is a mathematical device here. Okay, doesn't relate to anything real. 
It's just, uh, just a mathematical reformulation uh, to add more states and stages, but reduce the cost. What's important here is that making decisions one at a time is uh, equivalent to making decisions all at once because the transitions are deterministic. So the cost function of this problem and the optimal policy of this problem is the same as the original. Now, mm -hmm. okay, so let's leave it at that then. Okay. So now I'm going to go into adaptive control in the case where you don't have a model, you don't, or at least you have a partial model. Some of the model parameters are uh, unknown, either parameters in the system equation or parameters in the cost function or parameters in the probability distribution of the uncertainty. Um, okay, so let me talk through these ideas uh, with the, in connection with this adaptive cruise control example that I visited earlier. This is a little bit more complicated than the one I, 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 uh, I talked about in the previous lecture and it relates to the homework problem that you had uh, uh, for this week. Um, XK here is the car's velocity and it evolves according to this equation. Uh, UK is the propelling force. It relates to the settings of the throttle of the car, the gas pedal. Uh, WK some noise. And there are these coefficients here. And A is something that's less than one. And it models friction, wind drag, and other forces that tend to slow down the car, OK? And uh, the control tries to make up for this slowdown by applying acceleration. But the B coefficient is also unknown because it's affected for one thing by the weight of the car, whether it's one passenger, just the driver in the car, or there are five passengers. This will affect B. And uh, also there are other things, uh, whether the car is going uphill or it's going downhill. OK? so. These parameters are not known in reality, and they are also hard to estimate. Moreover, uh, some of the newer cars have adaptive cruise control, which involves also slowing down from the desired velocity of the car, uh, uh, slowing down because of proximity to the car ahead. So if the car ahead is too close, then there's a velocity profile that's applied here, which uh, uh, penalizes uh, deviation from this velocity profile. These X bars are given and they are calculated based on the distance to the car ahead. So you have radar here, calculates the distance to the car ahead and slows down the car by introducing penalties for deviating from that profile of velocities. And there's a quadratic cost, and there's also a penalty on the control with coefficient r, which is given. <coughs> now, the problem here is that a, b, and x, k are changing all the time. And uh, uh, they may be measured with some error, perhaps, but still, there are significant, there's significant uncertainty about them. And how do you deal with uh, a situation like that? You have a system that's changing on you all the time and you apply control, but uh, the system has deviated from what you were counting on, the nominal, it has gone into some other mod model. Adaptive control deals with situations like that. And like I said, it's an old subject, goes back more than 50 years ago. And there's been tremendous, there's tremendous, liter, tremendous amount of literature on it. So here are some of the possibilities. One possibility is to give up on measuring the parameters, just ignore the changes in the parameters, but design a controller that is robust, works for a broad range of parameters. Okay. 
And there is a control system design approach called PID control, proportional integral derivative control, which does not require a model at all. Uh, within a broad range of parameters, it works. And uh, it's limited in its application. It applies to single input, single output problems, but has a very, very long history. We're talking about uh, prehistory, perhaps, versions of this go way back uh, to 100 years ago, perhaps, or thereabouts. Um, and uh, uh, it's applied very widely. And uh, it has this robustness property, at least for some type of systems and problems. So that's one possibility. Just have a robust controller, perhaps PID or something that's more sophisticated, which works for a broad range of parameters. So as this change, the system is different, but still the controller does a good job of controlling. The alternative approach is to try to estimate the parameters as they are changing. So you have uh, some estimator of the parameters or model identifier that works in the background. And uh, based on the results of this estimation, we may modify the controller. And one possibility is to do online replanning by optimization. So as you estimate, as you have get new estimates of parameters, modify the controller to make it optimal for the current set. So the parameters change, we change the controller accordingly. We make it optimal for that current set. So this is sophisticated, but also time consuming because it requires not only online system identification to identify the new set of parameters, but also it requires the computation of an optimal controller. And computation of an optimal controller can be itself a very, very, very difficult issue. This also has some other pitfalls that um, one of these pitfalls is the, is the so-called problem of identifiability that um, as you are controlling the system with the nominal set of parameters, uh, you, you make it harder for the estimate, estimator to estimate the new parameters. In other words, the parameters of the system may not be identifiable in the presence of control. You have to overcome this impediment. Uh, the class nodes uh, deal with this problem with an example a little bit. It's a major problem. It has a lot of literature associated with it. But this is one possibility. And needless to say, a tremendous amount of work has been done in this area. And the problem is not solved yet, OK? There are, it's a challenging approach. Another approach that's simpler is to is to do online replanning, but not optimally, do it suboptimally by rollout with some base policy whose cost function is computed using the current parameter estimates. So in rollout, we have a base policy and we use uh, approximation in value space with a cost function of that base policy computed based on the system parameters and system and, and cost per stage. So as the parameters change, the system uh, changes, the parameters change, and the rollout algorithm also changes. And this is much simpler than this. OK. So let's focus on these two approaches for a little bit. Online replanning by optimization. We have the system, we have a controller some kind of a nominal controller here. Um, we obtain data from the system, states, measurements, whatever. And uh, we use this data in an estimator that estimates parameters and runs on the background. When we have 
when the parameters change significantly or we have confidence in their values in their est in these estimates we pass these estimates into the controller and the controller modifies itself in response so we recompute re the controller so it's optimal with the new sets for the new set of parameters and as i mentioned this can be time consuming so usually a suboptimal controller may be recalculated instead and uh, this scheme has its successes but also its pitfalls it also has a computational difficulty associated with this box and also with this box the simpler version is online replanning by rollout now remember the structure of rollout we are at a state we do a look ahead minimization in this uh, figure i'm showing a one-step look ahead minimization we look at all the possible states and then we simulate the base policy perhaps with some cost function approximation at the end using however the latest parameters that have been estimated so you can think here of having some kind of a cloud that that keeps track of the system, the cost and constraint parameters and passes them on. And these parameters are used in the simulation in the one step look ahead of these two boxes. So this is faster. And uh, I don't know if it's more reliable. I, I have the feeling that it, it is more reliable, but all of this is new and has not been tested sufficiently. So that's the way the scheme works. New parameter estimates in the look ahead minimization and the rollout of the base policy. However, we continue to use the same base policy, but it's also possible to recalculate the base policy in the background. Uh, as I receive more information at my leisure, so to speak, I change the base policy. Okay. So here's a computation that uh, illustrates what can happen. This corresponds to the, the fictitious simplified cruise control problem, where A is a one, okay? And there's one unknown parameter B here. This is all one dimensional. <coughs> is a quadratic cost, infinite horizon quadratic cost, with R being known, um, but, but could change, R could change here. Okay, so uh, this is a linear quadratic problem and solution uh, can be obtained in closed form. The optimal policy is linear function of the state. And uh, what I have plotted here is uh, the performance of a base policy, which is optimal for this nominal value of parameters, B equals two and R equals five. And now I have allowed the parameters to change. Okay, so here R is kept at 0.5, but B is, is changed within this range. And this gives the performance of the base policy. Here, I keep this base policy unchanged. Now, if I were to re-optimize in response to the base, the change value B, I would get this bottom curve, which says optimal. So, um, this base policy is quite robust in this region. Uh, for B equals two, it's optimal, okay? Around B equals two, it's close to optimal. But for large deviations of the B parameter, it goes considerably off optimal. So it's robust over here, but not so robust over here in this region. I have also plotted the rollout policy, which uh, 
with knowledge of this B obtains and applies not the optimal policy, but rather the rollout policy. And you can see that the two are indistinguishable. Far better performance from the base policy. And you would expect that because rollout improves on the performance of base. But also what's impressive is that there's hardly any loss of optimality uh, by using the simpler calculations of rollout. The same thing happens here where you keep B constant at equals and equal to two, but you change R from zero to 30. For R equals 0.5, somewhere over here, the base policy is optimal, okay? This is the nominal value for which it is designed. However, and it's reasonably robust in this region, but as you change R, it loses its robustness. The rollout policy does much better, uh, close to optimal, even though it is slightly suboptimal as you move within this range here. So this is sort of as an illustration between the, the policies you want to compare in, a, in an adaptive control setting. What happens when you do replanning re by optimal controlling, by optimal control, when you do replanning re by rollout, and when you don't do any replanning at all? You just rely on the robustness of the optimal control, of the nominal control. Are there any questions about this figure? Professor? Um... In this rollout, are we considering uh, the new parameter estimation as well? Yes, we consider, we assume that the estimator passes on the exact values of B and R. But the base policy does not take in that into account, does not respond to that. This optimal policy responds to them optimally, knowing B and R readjust the feedback gain of the controller to the optimal value. Rollout is also, also adjusts, but it adjusts uh, suboptimally, okay? Uh, in the context of rollout. So when we calculate this rollout controller, we have access to the exact values of B and R. Of course, this is an over-idealized example uh, but it, uh, it sort of serves to provide some insight of what can be gained and what can be lost as you pass from the least sophisticated policy to the most sophisticated policy. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Now, this is my last slide and it relates to model predictive control, a very important methodology in, in control system design, uh, almost dominant methodology in terms of uh, research. And it turns out that model predictive control is very closely connected to rollout. In fact, it can be viewed as a special case of rollout. Now, model predictive control applies to a variety of settings, but we are going to consider the simplest form, the form in, in which it was invented actually, where the system is deterministic, nonlinear deterministic, the cost function is uh, positive and it is equal to zero at the origin. So you pay a positive cost when X is far away from zero, the origin. By the way, X is a vector an n-dimensional vector of real components, u is an m-dimensional vector of real components. So this is like the linear quadratic problem, okay? But it's in a vector form and it's also non-linear. The cost is non-negative, like the quadratic cost, okay? And the cost is zero when you are at the origin. And there is a control. If you are at the origin, there is a control that keeps you there. 
like in a linear system, you are at x equals zero. If you apply zero control, you stay at zero, at least according to this deterministic model. So this is a very common model for problems where the objective is to keep the system near zero. In reality, there may be some noise also here, but the controller applied for the deterministic case, it is hoped, will bring you back towards zero. Okay, so how does model predictive control work? Well, at each state, it solves a one step look ahead or multi step look ahead minimization. In particular, it looks L steps ahead. L maybe is greater than one, maybe two, it may be a hundred, okay? And it minimizes the cost function over the next L stages, but requires that we bring the system exactly to zero not close to zero, but exactly to zero after L steps. So here we are at the current state and we consider an L step minimization problem with a constraint that the state should be zero after L steps. And then it is kept at zero by this control here. And we may this minimization will produce a sequence of controls, right? UK at time K, UK plus one and so on, a sequence of L controls. Modern predictive control applies the first control, the first component of the minimizing sequence and discards all the others. That's model predictive control. So let me repeat. You are at state K, solve a problem that's L steps long. Then obtain a sequence, UK, UK plus one, so one up to get UK plus L minus one. An L step optimal control sequence. Then throw away everything except the very first control and apply that at XK. That takes you to the next uh, stage and next state xk plus one and do the same thing. Look again, L steps ahead with the terminal state forced to be zero, apply the first control, discard the others and so on. Okay, so what's the connection with rollout? Well, in rollout, we have a one step look ahead and then application of some heuristic. Suppose that the heuristic is this minimization here, the right part of this minimization that involves the last n minus one stages, okay? So we want to minimize over the first control plus the heuristic cost, which is L minus one step minimization. So that's how we recover what we do in model predictive control. It is rollout with a base heuristic being the minimization that drives xk plus l to zero in l minus one steps. This part here, not l steps, l minus one steps. Now, MPC, as it's abbreviated, multiple control, MPC has some nice properties and they all derive from the connection of this uh, rollout. In particular, MPC is a stable controller. And the reason it's stable is that it performs better. It has a cost improvement property over this heuristic. This heuristic here is stable because it brings the state to zero and it keeps it at zero afterwards. So, the result is that the rollout performs better than the base heuristic. The base heuristic is stable. So the rollout, which is MPC, is also a stable controller. Now, this is very important for control engineering. 
And uh, the first concern when designing MPC type of uh, controllers is to make sure that you have a stability property. But there's another nice property here that MPC is well suited for online replanning. So if I have an estimator running here estimates in the background and uh, the system parameters change, these estimates are passed on to the MPC controller, which adjusts this minimization, does this minimization with the new parameters. In other words, it does online replanning based on parameter estimates as they are being obtained by the background estimator. These two properties, maintenance of stability and ability to online replan is a secret for the success of MPC. That's why people use it. And it can deal with adaptive control as well because it adapts to changing parameters uh, with online replanning. Of course, there's a number, of, a number of issues here. As you do this online replanning, okay, you're making a lot of changes and uh, uh, you have to make sure that you don't, you don't throw the system off stability or you, you, something bad does not happen. But the, the ability is built into this approach for adapting to changing system parameters. Let me also mention a variant that uses a terminal cost function approximation. Instead of, state, if, instead of bringing the state to zero, it uses a terminal cost function approximation. Okay, I'm sorry, the, the rest of this line is cut off from the slide, but, um, but what happens in this case is that simply you have a rollout that's truncated with, with cost function approximation at the end. So that's the only difference. And you have to make sure that, um, okay, the terminal cost approximation in order to get uh, stability that you need, may need some properties that um, uh, may need to be chosen to satisfy some conditions, uh, what we will call later. Uh, we will call it sequential improvement property, which is an important property in Rolla. Uh, but this is all part of uh, what we may most likely will cover in the next lecture. And uh, that's what we'll do. We're now with this lecture, we're done with the overview of the topics of this course. And I'm going to post uh, uh, some guidelines for, for selecting a term paper subject, okay? So you may start thinking about a term paper. Uh, it's not too early to do that. From now on, we're going to go more deeply. So far, we have been sort of uh, uh, being, uh, uh, sort of being in overview mode. Now we're going to try to go more deeply. And what we're going to do next time is cover general issues of one step and multi step look ahead approximation in value space, various describe informally various methods that we can use. And we'll go in some in uh, into into some into some discussion in more depth of uh, rollout for deterministic problems. Rollout is going to take us two or three lectures before we're done with it. I'm going to announce uh, homework, which will be related to this multi-vehicle uh, multi uh, routing problem. And for preparation for the next lecture, I've always recommended to, to, to do some preparation. Read the class notes. Uh, in this particular case, uh, uh, I would recommend to look at the relevant video lecture from the 2019 offering of the course. These video lectures are on my website. Look at video lecture three, which deals with these topics here. So we've reached the end of this lecture.
Are there any questions? I see a question in the chat. Are we discussing decentralized multi-agent systems? Uh, yes, we will discuss uh, uh, multi-agent systems, but it's gonna take us uh, probably four lectures to get there. We're gonna focus on multi-agent systems and in fact do quite a bit of, uh, uh, spend at least, uh, probably spend two lectures on that. Multi-agent problems, by the way, is a, is a, is a nice uh, area for doing uh, a term paper, a research-oriented term paper, because uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, systems that you can address with a methodology that we can we are going to be discussing here. Any other questions? Okay, guys. Okay, I'm looking at the chat. Okay, one question has to do with, uh, with codes. Is there any code uh, for, um, for the type of examples? that uh, we discussed uh, here in class? And the answer is no. There's no code that's publicly available for this. On the other hand, the homework that I'm giving involves very simple problems for which you either don't need a code, like for example, for the, for the homework of next week, you can do all the calculations by hand, okay? Uh, you can still calculate by hand. You can still know, you know how to do calculation by hand, right? That's the only calculation I learned <laughs> a long time ago. Uh, it's still possible to calculate by hand. And uh, the, um, the homework is going to be simple hand calculation. So you want to need a code and, uh, and uh, a lot of our homework is going to involve either hand calculation or a very simple code that you can write in a flash. There's another question in the chat. Would it be possible to extend the deadline for homework until the weekend? Okay. Uh, Okay, let's, uh, let's extend it. Since uh, this is the second request, it seems to be, a, seems to be some kind of a difficulty uh, with the homework. Let's extend it to Sunday uh, midnight, okay? And, um, and if that happens, then we're going to be assigning homework uh, after lecture but it's going to be due on the following Sunday, Sunday the following week. So that will give you a little bit more time to do your homework. So I'm going to send an announcement out. Homework is going to be due um, at the end of the day on Sunday. Any other questions? Okay, we'll see you all next week.